Cool. So uh, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, this is uh, uh, Xiang, and uh, today uh, we will co-host this uh, meetup about the journey and the future of Apache 1.0 uh, with my colleague uh, Jackie. So we will basically going through uh, four things today. The first one is our journey to Apache one Apache 1.0, and uh, then we will talk about the key features where uh introducing uh in pin 1.0 and uh, next we are going to talk about what are the things we plan to do in future and uh, the last part we will do a q a, Q &A session so um this is like uh, just a quick cap things like pin 1.0 we can only do it once and uh, this is a pretty big thing uh to this project we just want to do a quick recap on this project so Apache Pino it was coming from LinkedIn when we were building some LinkedIn core product called Who Viewed My Profile. This was back to like 2013. And at that time, Pino was just like three, three people's team and project focusing just on that single product, focusing on like how to solve the problem for uh, internal and external data analytics for like thousands or maybe hundreds of thousands of uh, QPS. And uh, meanwhile, we want to have like billions of events being ingested into the data system every day. And uh, that's where we started this Pino project. We solved this very hard core problem. And uh, then we started uh, getting more uh, internal use cases. And then we tried to open source it. If you may not really believe, we actually open sourced Pino in 2015. And uh, since then, uh, Pino got more attractive and uh, we are getting Pino adopted in uh, Uber, uh, where Uber started using uh, Pino for their uh, internal data analytics stack. At that time, it was mostly for uh, things like uh, internal uh, real-time data analytics, as well as uh, the core product for Uber is data analytics, because that's like the super real-time business. You need the, the uh, real-time interaction with uh, uh the 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 deliver uh the deliver people and also the 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 people who order the the food and in 2018 uh we moved Pino into the Apache incubation that's where we really started to build the community uh we really focus on like uh the features coming from uh, all the customers from like the, all over the world and uh, since then uh, when we built the community, we started growing the community. In 2019, this is where Starship also founded. But meanwhile, we are hitting like 100 uh, community members. And uh, since then, we are keep growing the community. In 2020, we have like uh, 800 members. We also have like more and more people contributing to uh, Apache Pino project. And in 2021, Pino finally graduated from Apache. That's like... Uh, also very big events, and we hit like 2,000 members. We also got more uh, big companies adopting Pino, like uh, Stripe, Cisco, Warma. And uh, then 2022, we got more people uh, using Pino, more companies using Pino, and more contributors. And uh, today, in 2013, 2023, 2020, we, are, we are actually getting like more uh more and more deployment. And also we want to launch this 1.0 release, which is a huge thing uh, to us and also to uh, the community. So this is like now our community grows. So from the uh, past five years, we have been seeing like uh, tremendous growth of the companies who are using the Slack members and as well as the Docker download. If you if you, you see this, like uh, the Docker downloads number is like, uh, a huge exponential growth from the five years ago. So this is like uh, just just to do a, do a, do a, some some kind of recap. This is like where we want to build Pino. At the very beginning, we were focusing on um, just the user fitting and, and uh, analytics. This is how we try to uh, divide the analytical workspace, right? Because uh, at the time when we are starting this project, we do have the clear uh kind of boundary of like okay this analytical product is only used for the internal right it's only for your internal corporate data analysis or you're actually building some key features 
that are used for uh, the ex external users, like this is a part of your data product, then people tend to build things, okay, I want to pre-aggregate, uh, pre-cubing a lot of things, put into a uh, key value store and then make it serving uh, to the end user. Uh, this is like, how, uh, at the very beginning, we have this like two quadrants. And uh, meanwhile, because of the reason of Kafka, uh, Flink, those kind of real-time streaming solutions, now more and more people want to like integrate the real-time data into their systems. Hence, we have this four quadrant. At the, at the very beginning, Pino is only focusing on the real-time uh, user-facing analytics, right? So it's like for, uh, we build it from LinkedIn for whom are who view my profile use cases, it's like for very high workload. And uh, then we try to like kind of divide this uh, analytical landscape to see like how we can actually achieve for this thing, right? So if you look at the uh, left uh, bottom side, it's mostly for your internal batch analysis, which like most of the data warehouse or like uh, people doing like data lake, they're they are pretty solving this they they're already solving this problem like in a pretty pretty good way that people can just uh, come write their arbitrary query and uh, get the results grab a coffee right so this kind of like uh, things are what their strengths are and the Pino is majorly focusing on the low latency and uh, data freshness and meanwhile this is like how we want to tackle the problem we started from the the very right. Uh, upper bot, uh, upper side, and then we conquer the problem of low latency, and then we get into the problem of like getting the data be more real time. As long as your data in Kafka or your data being processed by Flink, your data is available in Pino for query. And then we are going to tackle the hardest problem, which is like, okay, how to support the query flexibility. This is the major feature we are going to uh, introduce in uh, Pino 1.0, although it's already like, uh, in the testing of the alpha beta stage uh, for a while. Uh, this is like the major time we are going to announce uh, this thing. And we also got uh, uh, Uber, uh, which is like uh, using this feature uh, in production for a while. So here we're coming to the key features that uh, uh, we are going to introduce. Please do watch the video that uh, um, team has 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 been proved this is like you know pretty 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 convenient and uh, he's doing much better job than me uh but here like are the key, key features we are going to talk about the first one is the native drawings and the second one is the upstart enhancement the third one is the non-value support the first one the first one is like how we want to extend the uh the the ability of pino and make it like more pluggable and make more people easily to contribute to pino uh, now I'm going to hand this off to uh, Jackie. Uh, Jackie, you want me to? Uh... Yeah, you can keep. I, I'll, I'll tell you when to go to the okay, next slide. Good. But yeah, before before starting, I actually want to know if you have watched Tim's video. Please give me a thumb up because uh, <laughs> Tim gives a very very good uh, like high level overview of all these features, and then. I would say hey, he's doing like much better than me. So I I will mostly focus on the technical side within this meetup. If you haven't watched that, I highly strongly recommend please go over it. It has really good animation and then it explains the high level idea really clear. Okay, so let me start with like the most important feature they introduced in uh, Apache, you know, 1.0 is the join. So as Sean mentioned, like we started, you know, to solve the problem of like super low latency, high throughput use cases. And then uh, to tackle that, we rely on the data to be pre-joined. And then Pino can build index on the pre-joined single table with, for example, pre-aggregation and pre-cubing. So we use, these techniques to solve the the first stage problem. But then right now, after releasing 1.0, we want to extend the capability of Pino to make it much more flexible. And then basically with the on-the-fly join support, we can support join, we can support window function. It will bring Pino 
to the next level. I can see a lot of use cases that can be powered by the drawing. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so the core thing to power the on the fly drawing is we call it body stage query engine. So the difference between this engine and the old engine is in the old engine, uh, there's only one stage. Basically, broker get the query, analyze the query, and then find all the servers hosting the data. Send one request to the server, gather results from the server, and then just merge the result and return it back. So there's one one single stage, very straightforward. So the problem with that is we cannot really do join with one single stage because, uh, I mean, it's possible if we gather everything from server and then do it on broker, but we will run into scalable issue where broker will simply explode, thinking of case where we need to join two tables with billions of records. So there we need to leverage more servers to tackle this problem. And then we introduce this multi-stage where there can be multiple data exchanges to shuffle data around. And then within each stage, there can be multiple workers. So this way there will be no longer a scalable issue. We can use as many workers as needed to process the flexible, but very expensive query. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so before 1.0, uh, Pino have, has actually very limited support on join by pre, uh, uh, how to, like, we have a technique called, called lookup join where we can pre pre uh, assign all the real time uh, not real sorry the right table replicate it to all the servers hosting the left table so that when we run the lookup join left table can look up the right table in memory so the reason why I said this has limited support is. The the uh with this approach we need a like size limit to the right table and the right table is hosted in memory. So basically we cannot host a very big table in memory. Then that's the right right side uh lookup join in this graph. Then in the multi-stage query engine, uh basically we tackle two most uh commonly joined fashion. One is the broadcast join, where we can broadcast the right table uh, on the fly to the left table and then do the join similar to lookup join. But the key difference between broadcast join and lookup join is we can actually first uh, filter the records. So we don't really need to broadcast everything from right hand side to the left hand side. And the, a more important feature is a hash, hash based distributed join, where we actually uh, pull data from both left hand side and right hand side with filter push down. And then basically we can partition the tables on the fly and then assign, shuffle the data to the next stage so that the next stage server just holds one partition of hash data. So this is a common technique. Uh, basically, after you know 1.0, we we start supporting this scenario. Uh, next, next slides, please. Uh, yeah. So we'll have a Q and C Q and A session. So during that session, we will answer questions uh, in the chat. Okay. So now I want to focus on some um, optimizations happening within Pino because. Uh, even after this, with higher flexibility, we still want to build Pino you know, to be able to serve a low latency, high throughput use case. So we spend a lot of time optimizing the performance. So right now we are focusing on this hash based partition join. So uh, this in this graph, uh, it shows uh, during a hash partition join, how the data is moved. So let's say I want to hash partition the data into two uh, into into four partitions, and 
So basically, there are two stages in this join. One is table scan stage where we uh, scan the records from the physical table stored on server. And then we shuffle the data into the join stage. So if we don't put data, like uh, if we don't have any special handling on the location of the data, during the shuffle stage, the data from each server need to be shuffled to each partition. So in this graph, you can see there are like dotted lines and then the solid lines. The solid lines means the data doesn't need over the wire shuffling or over the fire wire transferring. And then basically, uh, if the join stage is executed on the same server, uh, we don't need uh, cross server data transferring. So in this graph, we can see majority of the data need to be shuffled because there's no particular like uh, partitioning happened at the storage layer. Uh, next slide, please. Yes. So second one is we can actually partition the data at the storage side so that we know like, for example, partition zero data is always located in server zero, partition one in server one, partition two, server two, partition three, server three. But then actually the let's think of the green box as left table and blue box as right table. They can be partitioned, but they are not really co-located. Meaning left table, left table we don't really need uh, cross server data transferring, but this doesn't apply to right table. So right table, we still do need to do this transfer. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, the we we introduce a co-located join where uh, when we ingest data, we partition the data so that uh, the segment for the same partition on both left and right table are on the same server. So basically we co-located the, uh, the segments so that there's no data transferring cross nodes required anymore. So we see significant performance improvement from this because uh, over the wire transferring, like the IO and network latency is involved here and like everything saved in memory. And we don't need to, another another big optimization is we can skip the 30 for the in-memory data structure. Uh, so next, I want to share some performance we get from all these optimizations. So here's a left join query with two tables, and then there's a group by, aggregation group by on top of it. So we start with no optimization, basically uh, as uh, uh, it's like a full table scan, and then we actually apply the filter after join. So this query initially takes 30, 39 seconds. Still pretty good, but yeah, we, we don't want to stop there. Uh, by the way, so this two table, the, the size is about 10 terabytes. So I think in data bar cost scenario, this query will take probably multiple minutes. And then after that, first try we did is we co-locate the segments. And then we avoid the data shuffling across servers. And then with this, we got 2.6x performance boost, and then the latency dropped to 15 seconds. Then we did another check by pushing down the filter as well as the aggregation. Basically, we can first do the aggregation group by on the left table. And then we can join with the group by result to the right table. So with this trick, uh, the latency dropped to 4.5 seconds. Then there's the next step is we do we did the partition aware join where Without this partition, we're aware of one, even though the segments are co-located, we don't group segments by partition. Meaning even though there's no segment, uh, no data shuffling, uh, 
uh, we uh, so we don't get the same pattern. Think of the case where like I have ten partitions on the same server. So actually, I can use ten thread executing them in parallel because I know there's no overlapping data across partitions. So basically, partition aware join uh, supports uh, doing high parallelism per partition. So with this, we get query latency down to 3.3 seconds. And then we, we start exploring, OK, so it's being a linear scalable, meaning if given more hardware, will it reduce latency almost linearly? And then we try to increase the hardware uh, CPU cores from four cores to 32 cores. And then we see very good result by reducing latency to 0 0.5 seconds. So basically, you know, it's almost linear scalable with hardware. Uh, meaning, if given enough hardware, you know, can, I wouldn't say arbitrarily reduce the latency, but uh, it can reduce latency to sub-second, even for such a expensive query. Next slide. Okay, so that's all about Joy. So next I want to talk about the, the absurd feature. So absurd feature is, was introduced, I think it's introduced like one year back. And uh, we have seen a lot of use cases on top of this. Uh, basically what it does is it takes the streaming data and the absurd feature allows uh, the records in the database to be modified. So majority of the OLAP database to achieve low latency, the data is immutable. But uh, with absurd, we can we can up, update it, uh, update data uh, at ingestion time. So basically, it's updated immediately after the record is ingested. And then we design it in a way that the query overhead is minimal. Basically, every uh, all this processing happened at ingestion time. So at query time, all we need to do is apply a bitmap, which is uh, very cheap. And uh, also, like uh, we make it very flexible. So it's possible to uh, plug in the uh, like off heap. So one limitation for absurd is everything, all the metadata is hosted in Java memory. So but we build it very flexible so that it's possible to plug in the uh, off heap or like even external key value store to power this metadata. So with this, actually at Star Tree, we actually we, we have achieved like serving billions of primary keys per server. And that actually tackle the initial scalable issue of absurd. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so here I want to introduce like uh, something new added in Bino 1.0. Most important thing about absurd is now we start supporting delete in absurd. So to delete a record, basically we designed a special column called delete record column where a user can provide a Boolean flag to notify Pino if I want to delete a given primary key. So with delete, I would say the absurd feature is complete because basically we can do insert, update, and delete. Uh, since, since delete is added, we can, for example, mirror the change from a uh, transactional database, and then we can start running analysis on top of it. Basically, we, we just need to we just need to mirror the change log. Then uh, the Pino data will be in sync with the other database. Uh, next, please. Yeah. Then that is a feature new feature. Then we want to talk about some improvements on memory and storage overhead. So as I mentioned, so the default implementation for absurd serves all the metadata in memory. 
so that there's we can run into scalable issue if there are too many primary keys uh, inserted. That's why uh, we added the TTL support where we allow user to configure uh, TTL for the upsert metadata. So after the metadata expires, we no longer track that. So this way we can reduce a lot of memory footprint for upsert. And then basically this technique can be applied to use cases where the primary key has a very clear life cycle. For example, if we want to track some ordering and then the order order like it's no, no longer relevant after one week, for example. And then this is about the memory side. We also did uh, some improve, improvement on the storage side where we introduced the segment compaction minion task. Uh, the upsert actually within pnode is soft update where pnode actually keeps both old and new record. So what this compaction task can do is it can actually periodically pull segments from server and then identify what records are still valid, what records are deleted or like updated. Then it can regenerate the segment to remove this invalid records and then overall reduce the storage overhead. Uh, next, please. Yeah. So after improving the memory and storage overhead, we start uh, doing some optimization on the operational side. So for upsert, right now it works uh, in a way where all the upsert metadata is rebuilt when server restarts. So basically uh, when we load a lot of primary keys into upsert metadata, we observe like server start takes hours. So we start uh, putting some effort optimizing this. So there are essentially two techniques we apply. One is uh, when server, when segment commit, we take snapshot for the valid records within the segment. So when server starts, we don't really need to look at all records. We just need to scan over all these valid records and then rebuild the metadata. The next step, we, we actually bring it further to support a feature called preload segments. In regular case, uh, thinking of absurd when we ingest a, data, in ingest a record, we need to look up the primary key, compare the time stamp, and then decide whether the new record is valid or not. So basically, this is like read after, sorry, write after read. So I need to first read, check, and then write. With preload, since I know server just started, I don't really, and with this valid doc IDs, I know what records are valid. And then there's no ongoing data ingest, uh, ingesting. So I can actually skip this reading step and then directly write all records into the absolute metadata. So with both this tool optimizations for 1 billion keys, we reduce the restart time from about two hours to 10 minutes. Next, please. Okay, so next one, I want to introduce the non-value support. So I would say we started working on this non-value support about one year ago. And then now I think we have reached a state where majority of the use case can be supported. So to enable the non-value support, uh, we need to set two flags, one during the ingestion. Uh, it's called non-handling enabled in the table index config. So this config will uh, will let pnode preserve the non-value during ingestion. And then at query time, because there are certain overhead when non-handling is enabled, so we we still don't have it enabled by default. We ask user to set this enable non-handling flag to turn it on. Because when non-handling is enabled, uh, we can no longer use primitive type. So there's some limitation on the Java. Uh, in, in Java, so in the future, uh, there's an ongoing effort to make this by default and we will try to minimize the overhead of non-handling support. 
Uh, next, please. So I will I will show some example queries to demo uh, the queries that we <clears throat> we can support non values. For example, the first one is select. Uh, on the left hand side, I have non handling enabled, and on the right hand side, I have it disabled. So we can compare the result. So basically, the first one is simple select star. And then if we compare left and right hand side, uh, the, the double dash in the UI uh, represents now. So we can see there are some null values in description and salary. And the without now, it's, it's stored for description as string now, and then for salary is actually integer min value. So uh, next slide, please. Okay, second one is the non support within filter. On the left hand side, we can see salary. Uh, we have a filter on salary smaller than uh, 100K. So this is random data. So it, it, ha it has no real life indication. But like uh, when the non handling is supported, salary is smaller than something. So it will skip all the non values. And we can see the result is two. On the right hand side, since the non value for integer salary is integer min. If we don't enable non-handling, all integer min value is smaller than 100K. So that's why this query actually gave 58 as a result. Uh, next, please. Okay, next one I want to talk about aggregate. So in aggregate, when aggregating on a, a knowable column, uh, we the real like standard cycle behavior is we should skip all the normal. That's the the result showing on the left hand side where min salary is a positive value. But on the right hand side, since the default value is integer min, so this min value will show integer min instead of the real non non positive value. Next. Yeah, so Combining aggregate and filter, we actually have an aggregate filter feature where we can apply filter on each aggregate individually. So in this query example, I basically it is combining aggregate with filter, and then we can see it works properly on null values. Next. Yeah, null value can also be uh, used in the group by clause as the group by key. So here, we can see like we are grouped by this uh, knowable salary column. And then on the left hand side, uh, the group key is shown as null. And then on the right hand side, the group key shows as default value. Next. Uh, yeah, so this is a non support on order by. So similarly, when we order by salary, on the left, on the, uh, sorry, so in this, in this, uh, slides, I showed both sides as non handling enabled because I want to actually demo a feature of non first and non last. By default, uh, in SQL standard, non values are ordered always in the uh, non values are ordered as the largest value. That's the SQL standard. So, without uh, explicit non first or non last, non value will be treated as the largest one. That's why order by a novel column in descending order will show now as the first element. On the right-hand side, we actually support this nouns last where it can order nouns in the end. So with nouns last added, we can see non values are not showing up here anymore because we, we are doing our limit too. Uh, next. Okay, I think this last one. I want to demo how the non values are supported in transform. So here we are doing a case one where salary, if salary is smaller than 100K, we return one out zero. So basically this should have the same behavior as count star and where salary is smaller than 100K. And then the result is the same. Basically, with non handling is two, and without non handling is fifty eight. And I think that's all for the non value support.
Now I will hand it back to Xiang to talk about the pluggable architecture. Okay. Yeah. So thanks for the very detailed uh, <laughs> introduction. So uh, I'm going to talk about this uh, pluggable architecture. So this is also the work uh, actually has been uh, introduced into Pino like uh, a very long time ago in like uh, 2019. That's like when we really think of like how we make Pino uh, project to be like uh, really contributable by the community. Uh, so that's why we actually separated. We do a lot of refactoring to make a Pino SPI kind of uh, uh, module. It, it's something like people can just like write their own code and uh, uh, it's like a pretty separated module, modulable feature for, for users. This is like uh, where it uh, uh, getting started and uh, this is how it looks like. So at the very beginning, we only have this Pino SPI and it has like the interface for how you implement your own Pino file system, like how you do the data ingestion. You can write, at that time we only have like Kafka support. Now we can do more support like Kinesis support, server, Red Panda. And we also have different input format. It's like uh, at the very beginning, because LinkedIn is only using Avro and uh, Uber is using Parquet. That's like pretty much the <clears throat> only two kind of libraries where we are where going to support for the input format. And then later on, we added like the ORC, JSON, proto, different, uh, different uh, data format support. Um, the, now we, we actually expand this pluggable architecture to more features that we allow more ability for a uh, user to make a Pino more pluggable feature uh, kind of engine. And uh, uh, one thing we introduce is this uh, Pino index SPI, which we extract all the Pino index into uh, different implementation like a module so that now, uh, I, I mean, before that, we have like all the uh, index being built with, within the, the Pino core uh, engine itself. But now we can extract those things and try to load load those things by, by, by itself, or we can uh, allow, let's say, users or community members to actually contribute more index if they feel this is like useful. Apart from that, we also have like the Pino segment API, which will allow Pino to actually build a, a segment and the load segment from local. This is like where the default implementation. And we also allow user to like further extend it. Let's say if your data are on S3 or on your whatever, like uh, Google Cloud Storage or Azure Data data Lake, right? W wherever your data are, if you have a way to load it, no matter it's local or remote, you have a way to plug your data Pino segment into uh, through this SPI. Uh, the last part is like, as we are introducing new query engine, we split the query uh, engine kind of SPI into like a planner and a runtime phase uh, so that we can make this like multi-stage query engine and uh, the single stage query engine uh, more explicit. And uh, this this work is still ongoing. Uh, we will share more insights later. Uh, so this is like uh, the, the beauty of the index SPI. Right now, we only support the index SPI per column basis, which means that all those uh, index are applied only on the single uh, columns. If you look at, we already have like the invert index, the sorted index for like fast filtering. Yeah, actually, most of the the the, the index are for the fast filtering. Uh, start index because it's like the pre pre cubing pre aggregate kind of index, so it's not really uh fitting to this like uh, index SPI uh kind of uh, arch uh architecture. So here I'm going to talk about what's new for Apache Pino after 1.0 release. Uh, here are like the major uh, things that we're going to do because we supported this kind of multi-stage uh, multi query engine. This is actually a very um, fundamental thing that we put into 1.0. Further, we can actually support more uh, SQL features and we want to add more, <clears throat> we want to support like the full SQL uh, capability and also support more like uh, query capabilities into Pino. Uh, second thing here is that uh, we want to also uh, make Pino powerful in terms of like uh, supporting uh, vector data, uh, vector vector uh, data type, and uh, we we already see like uh, the the reading uh, use cases of like uh, the the JNI era, and uh, Pino can actually be a good part in terms of like uh, supporting this kind of search use cases because the pin already supported a lot of like text search log, log use cases. Uh, next part here is about the Java 17 and the 21 support. This is like uh, the long way 
kind of a journey which we started like three or four years back. And uh, now things like uh, JDK 8 is already being kind of deprecated. Even Java, uh, Java 11 is kind of deprecated uh, from the open JDK perspective. Uh, we, we also want to like uh, upgrade Pino to more modern uh, JDK versions and the leverage all the uh, good features that's introduced uh, from the, the, the Java itself. And of course, we also want to like try out the Pino in new use cases like log metrics, tracing, vector search, all those kind of things are what we are expecting next. So here are the full sequels. Uh, right now, all those three things are like uh, top of my mind. So when it's about the metric recognize. So this is kind of like uh, the query that we want to extract the pattern uh, from your time series data. And uh, from this pattern, uh, we basically can extract uh, like, uh, for, I mean, this ex in this uh, example, it's trying to get uh, like all the stocks and then we partition the stocks by the symbol. And then we try to find the pattern that this stock going up, then going down. We want to match the pattern, find this kind of record back. This is how uh, the match recognize um, works. And the next thing here is about the full array kind of support. We want to support all the unnest thing and uh, uh, the usage of the, the array because right now, Pino, it has like the multi uh, value. Uh, in 1.0 release, we make a bridge of like uh, array to MV kind of um, uh syntactic sugar to bridge the uh, array uh, multi-value group by at, uh, into the array operations and uh, later on we want to fully support this like the the whole array support for all the honest kind of queries uh the next thing here is here is about uh, the materialized views for materialized views they are like uh multiple uh things we need to hardening anyway. ways like how we define a view since pino is more focusing on the postgres uh, compatibility. So here I just pasted like uh, post how Postgres did this, like how we do, how we want to do the view definition, how we want to refresh a view, because usually your view is like uh, more on the steady side, and how to make real time data or real time table works with the kind of like uh, near real time views is a very challenging problem. And also how we want to create an index on top of the materialized view and make it like. Uh, more coreable because in the end of the day, although we have a, a lot of like uh, ability and uh, let's say get a lot of uh, performance and the benefit from starting that, uh, we also realize that the materialized view is also something good for people at least to write, uh, rewrite their query, uh, make a data set or like uh, uh, their kind of data definition more, uh, more clean and more simpler. And the last part is like uh, when how 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 you do this dependency update. Let's say your base table has has updated. You, you add a new new data or you get a new schema evolution. How you actually can update your uh, mm -hmm. view. So all those things are like uh, we 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 will take a look at it after this one point of release. Um, here I'm going to talk about some vector spot. So for the vector thing, since this is like. Uh, it, the, the the era is coming, so we have to embrace it. Uh, and uh, this is kind of the back support we are going to do. Uh, so first of all, the data type part, uh, we are going to do like the fixed lens of inflow byte array. Uh, this is kind of like how you keep your data as like the embedding. Uh, from the function wise, we do all the distance kind of things. Uh, all those things are already supported in Pino. Uh, I think after 1.0, the only thing that uh, uh, we're still working on is about uh, the indexes. We're trying out HNSW or uh, fast kind of index. And uh, once all those things have been placed, uh, we will be able to do all those like approximation kind of um, uh, nearest neighbor search, these kind of use cases. So this is already like one example I show from the current quick start is like, you can actually do some search based on the similarity and then you can order by based on the distance, right? So this is like how you can do nearest neighbor kind of search. But this thing is just giving you all the uh, accurate, it's not uh, the approximation. Uh, next thing I'm going to talk about is uh, 17 and the 21 uh, Java upgrade. So uh, the major uh, problem we are facing here is about the array. Uh, it's actually deprecated in, um, it's, it's not usable after 
uh, Java 15. That's why uh, uh, Gonzalo take, took the lead and rewrite the library uh, for the replacement. We were testing it internally and externally uh, to ensure the performance, the functionality, everything works. We also say that uh, just by changing our Docker image from Java 17, from, from Java 11 to 17 or 21, we see pretty much like all the queries get some benefit uh, from uh, Java 11. Uh, also, uh, here from open source perspective, we're already publishing all the Pino Docker images uh, with different uh, um, Java runtime. So all the images are still built in Java uh, in JDK 11, but the runtime are like you can pick it's Amazon uh, 11 or 17 or MS Open JDK 11 17 and Open JDK 21. That's all the Docker images we're, we're we're supporting. You can add the 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 suffix for that uh, Docker image and uh, you can pick the different uh, uh, JDK. And the uh, last part uh, we're talking about is about new use, use cases. So recently we saw a good edge block from Uber. Uber is trying to like replace uh, their internal search uh, search kind of engine uh, by Pino. They, in, they introduced this compressed log processor, which get them lossless compression. They are getting about like one 169 times of the uh, data compression, and uh, also they got uh, the ability of search without any decompression, which means that uh, uh, you can just uh, search. So there's no extra CPU cycle for uh, data decompression, right? And uh, this this use case has like a significant saving their storage, memory, and uh, as well as their bandwidth for like uh, this kind of work. So so this slide is what I'm stealing from their uh, uh, Uber 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 meetup. So basically, they, they achieve like a huge uh, cost of saving from uh, ELK, from the data, uh, from the hardware, a lot of things. Uh, moreover, we, we also want to explore like more use cases, like for example, how Pino can really, uh, as like a time series database, how it can support the metrics use cases, especially like uh, for a lot of metrics uh, use cases, they have like arbitrary tags, right? So you have like, uh, you can you know, give give it's still like a problematic kind of tax. Uh, how Pino can really like work on this kind of use cases are like very challenging. And of course, uh, for vector search, uh, we're 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 working on this AN search use cases with different indexes. So that's pretty much uh, all the things we're going to we were introduced today. And uh, uh, yeah, to the the last part, I I really want to uh, thank everyone. Uh, who are uh, Pino contributors, community members, and uh, the Pino users, and all the uh, feedbacks, all the talks we are having on Slack are like uh, very uh, useful, very very treasurable to to us. And uh, yeah, together we are we're making this Pino 1.0 release, and uh, in the future we are we're going to make Pino community stronger and better. Yeah, thanks everyone, uh, Yarden team. Thank you, Jackie and Zhang. Uh, that was fantastic and detailed. And thanks thanks for the kind words about the video. The thing is about the difference between what you just did in that video is there's a lot more technical detail here. So we actually got to see how these things work under the covers, which I think is important. It's always important to me to know um, when something seems magical, you know, like when I don't know how... Uh, just any piece of technology is doing a thing. Like, I don't know how joins work or something. And then you come into a problem. It's hard to reason about it, at least for me, because I'm like, oh, that's a magical thing. You can't think about it. But once you know what's going on inside the box, um, you know, even if you're not a Pinot committer, but you just know something about what's going on inside the box. For me, that always makes me stop thinking of it as magical and I'm able to reason about it. So mm -hmm. I think this is just super helpful. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Um, and yeah, I will, we have five more minutes. Let's maybe open it for Q&A. If someone has a question, feel free to open a camera or don't op open, just ask or type in in the chat. Robert, you said, you mentioned you had a few questions. Maybe you got uh, your answers, um, but that's the time. Wow. Uh, I, I thought I had questions and now I have even more questions. Uh, very exciting. Um, I guess around performance and joins, uh, Jackie, the optimizations 
you mentioned around co-location and partition aware joins, does that um, re uh, require the data to be um, like pre-partitioned and pre-co-located before the join? I mean, how much uh, data prep work is, is needed to take advantage of these optimizations? Yeah, that's a great question. So I I, I do mention like uh, the data need to be pre-allocated to the correct server or pre-assigned to the correct server. So basically what we need is uh, Pino has all the primitives to not really primitive. So we will share some recipe about how to configure. So basically uh, during ingestion in the table config, you want to config the key to be partitioned on. And then you want to, config. so basically it, it, it's a Sigma assignment config. Well, with that config, you know, we'll automatically uh, assign the segment to the proper server. And then to ensure the two tables are co-located. It does have some limitations where you can only partition on one key. But usually you only use one uh, ID key or something to do the join. So usually that works. If you need to join with different table, uh, with different keys, then basically you might want to pick the most expensive one or the highest cardinality one and partition on that one and collect it on that column. Does this answer your question? Uh, yes, um, and it's mainly optimizing um, for the intermediary shuffle stages. Uh, and also the, the higher concurrency, because with partitioning, we can do power partition co uh, computation in parallel. If it's partitioned but not co-located, we can still do this partition based. Uh, optimization, but then you have cross node data transferring. Okay, so guys, if you have more questions, so I shared the link to our Statri uh, Slack space. So please feel free to join. We have their access to 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 Shang and to Jackie and to Tim and to me and to everyone to the other community members. You can ask their more questions as you need. Um. Yes, and thank you for joining. Thank you, Jackie and Shang and team. And um, great to see you all. And we'll meet in the next meetup. Bye-bye. Thanks, bye. Ren. <laughs> bye. Thanks, Shang. Thanks, Jackie. Cool. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye.